I often talk about index funds and passive investing and I was really excited to see there's a new book out about this called Trillions by Robin Wigglesworth. Now what's wonderful about the way he tells the story is that it's about people, their passions, their difficulties and ultimately it's not about mathematics or fancy theories and that makes it much more readable. But if you want to ask your own questions of Robin there will be a live Q&A session about that on this channel and there'll be details about that at the end of this video. So now let's look at the history of index investing in a bit more detail. The story begins with what seems like a really simple question, which is what do stocks return? In the late 1950s, Lewis Engel, who you can see beside me, wanted to find out exactly how much stocks had returned relative to other asset classes over a long period of time. And the reason why was that he'd written these really long advertorials in the Wall Street Journal, which were pushing the services of his broker Merrill Lynch. But the SEC said that if he wanted to say that stocks were good for the long run, he'd have to have the evidence to back it up. Now remember this was a time before computing became much more widespread, so simply calculating the average of lots of stocks in real time was unthinkable. So Engel and Merrill Lynch funded a research project at the University of Chicago to do exactly that, to calculate the average price of thousands of stocks on the New York Stock Exchange to see exactly what the long term return was. And that led to the creation of the Center for Research and Security Prices or CRSP. And these two people, Lawrence Fisher and James Laurie, are the unsung heroes of CRSP. Now as we'll see later in the story, that CRSP database was to prove critical. Now like all IT projects, it took longer than expected, it took four years, but eventually here's the publication where they actually announced the number. This was in January 1964. So what Fisher and Laurie did was to look at all of the stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange and they tracked the returns you would have got from investing in all of them between 1926 and 1960. And the average annual return was 9%. Now that was surprisingly high. And immediately it led people to ask the question, how does this compare with an actively managed portfolio? If I'm paying extra to get experts to pick my stocks for me, they should be getting better results than this 9%. And the answer to that question of how active managers stacked up relative to the market was answered and popularised by Burton Malkiel when he published a book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street in 1973. And he certainly didn't pull his punches. He said that a blindfolded monkey throwing darts at the financial pages of a newspaper could select a portfolio that would do just as well as one carefully selected by experts. If you like our videos, an even better way to learn about investing is as a member of our Patreon community. To learn more about that, just click on the link beside me and in the description below me. And also you'll learn about all the goodies you get access to, such as members only tools and our growing library of members only content. It's not as if active managers aren't trying. Why is it actually so hard to beat markets? The reason why it's so hard is that markets very quickly price in any new available information. And the label that was coined by Eugene Farmer, and he won the Nobel Prize for this later, was that this was called an efficient market. In fact, Alfred Cowles III put out a report in 1932 which said exactly this. His conclusion was that when he looked at the records of active managers, they failed to exhibit any kind of skill in investment. Then he repeated the exercise in 1944 and showed essentially the same thing. So here you can see the performance of the S&P 500 between 1928 and 1943. And if you look at the average index of forecasters, you can see that it deviates above and below that line. There is no consistent outperformance. And multiple studies since then have confirmed this result. So in this study in 1967 by Michael Jensen, he showed that 115 mutual funds underperformed a buy and hold strategy and that the performance that was seen could be attributed to random chance. Not only that, but the active stock pickers performance was so bad that they didn't actually recoup their brokerage expenses. So given that people knew that active funds underperformed the index as a whole, it was annoying that you couldn't buy the index. There were no index funds. So this was the environment in the early 1970s which led to the birth of the first index funds. 
Now of course there was a lot of supporting theory which led to the creation of index funds. We've already seen how Eugene Farmer's efficient markets hypothesis showed that it was difficult to beat markets. But Harry Markowitz had also created these beautiful theories about portfolio diversification. And his theory showed how you could keep the return of a portfolio while at the same time reducing risk through diversification. So if you buy an index fund, it'll be very diversified, but it won't necessarily sacrifice returns. And William Sharp, who created the Sharp Ratio, showed how you could very easily compare different investments by looking at the excess return above the risk-free rate divided by the risk that you were taking to generate that return. Theory is all very well, but what you really want is someone who's willing to get their hands dirty with a bit of financial engineering. And John Mac McQuone was the ideal person to do it. He was very au fait with computers, which were required to do the calculations, but he was also familiar with the theory of efficient markets. This is what McQuone looks like now. He's got a bit more grey hair, but he was effectively the father of the very first index funds. In 1964, McQuone was hired by Wells Fargo to head up a new outfit called the Management Sciences Division. Now, McQuone's genius was to combine three incredibly important things. The first one was to use that CRSP data that we saw at the beginning. In fact, Wells Fargo was one of the first commercial users of that data. Secondly, McQuone hired the best theoreticians to help him in his work. Many of these later went on to win the Nobel Prize for Economics, and that included Bill Sharp, Harry Markowitz, Merton Miller, and the creators of the Black-Scholes pricing equation, Fisher Black and Myron Scholes. And the third critical ingredient was computing power. Now, this computer from IBM is less powerful than your mobile phone, but at the time it was state-of-the-art. And this would allow them to compute what the weightings should be for individual individual stocks in their index. Now, of course, all of this is useless without a client. If you can't get someone to buy your index fund, it's no use at all. It turned out that one of the family members that owned the Samsonite company knew about efficient markets, and they wanted an index fund for their company pension. So they approached Wells Fargo in order to create this fund. The headquarters of Samsonite were in Denver, so McQuone got on an aeroplane straight away and went to see what they wanted. Samsonite agreed to it, and they handed over $6 million for Wells Fargo to create the first index fund. Now, this was actually an equal weighted fund, such that it bought equal amounts of all the stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. As it turned out, that was hugely impractical. But still, July 1971 marked the creation of the first index fund. Now, where one company has created an innovation, you can be sure there'll be competitors. And a company called Battery March created an S&P 500 tracker in 1972. Then in September 1973, American National Bank created another S&P tracker. And Wells Fargo created a more practical version of their tracker in November 1973. And this one tracked the S&P 500 too. Even then, the fees were very low. So that's 0.03% to 0.06%. But you may be thinking, where's Vanguard? Well, it turned out that Jack Bogle was a very late convert to passive investing. Although now he's seen as the father of passive investing, he was initially very much opposed to it. In 1960, he wrote this article in the Financial Analyst Journal, but he wrote it under a pseudonym of John B. Armstrong. And his conclusion was that active common stock funds have beaten the Dow Jones Industrial Average. In this tribute to Jack Bogle on the Vanguard website, it tells a history of how he came to found Vanguard. Now, initially, Jack Bogle worked for an asset manager called Wellington. Now, he very quickly moved up the ranks at Wellington, and at the age of just 35, he made executive vice president. Now, the decision that led to his downfall at Wellington was a merger with another company based in Boston. That was Thorndike, Duran, Payne and Lewis. Now, between 73 and 74, there was a downturn in equity markets, which affected performance of Wellington funds. And as a result, people pulled their money out of those funds. That led to a management dispute, which eventually led to the firing of Jack Bogle. Now, he was bitter about that firing for the rest of his life, but he was never someone to take things lying down. And he actually came up with a proposal to set up a new company, which he could head which would effectively just look after the admin for Wellington. Now, at the time, many mutual funds would outsource many of their functions, and that was expensive, whereas Vanguard would have in-house managers to actually manage the funds, and that would reduce costs. 
Now, after Vanguard was set up, Bogle read an article by someone called Samuelson, which said that we should have retail investors buying these index funds directly. And that was a pivotal moment for Jack Bogle, because he realised that the Vanguard structure would sit very well with a low-cost passive index fund. So as Robin Wigglesworth says, this innovation for retail investors, index funds we can buy, actually came from Vanguard's hamstrung circumstances and Jack Bogle's attempt to get out from under the thumb of Wellington. But this is why Vanguard was late to the game. In fact, they didn't launch their index fund until 1976. And this was called the First Index Investment Trust. But far from being a huge success, it was a massive flop. In fact, it only raised $11 million after it was launched. That wasn't enough to actually buy all of the stocks in the S&P 500. And the press were particularly unpleasant about it. They called it Bogle's Folly. Now, of course, we all now know that Vanguard's been very successful with its passive, cheap index trackers. But it must have required incredible strength of character to keep going in the face of all of this opposition. And I think that's a tribute to Jack Bogle. The next big innovation in index funds was exchange-traded funds. And it's often the case that innovation comes with a crisis. And in the case of exchange-traded funds, that crisis was the 1987 crash. In fact, the SEC report, which you can see above me here, said that it would be good to have a basket product where you could trade multiple stocks at once on an exchange. The SEC thought this would be a great way of maintaining liquidity in markets during these crises. And one of the main characters behind the creation of ETFs was a physicist, an ex-submariner, called Nate Most. Now, he'd spent time travelling around the Pacific, and he'd noticed that when people were trading commodities, like barrels of coconut oil, they wouldn't trade the bulky commodity itself. Instead, what they did was to trade the receipts for those commodities. So Moss's insight was to say, why don't we create receipts for baskets of stocks instead of barrels of commodities? Now, the system whereby you can create baskets of stocks and destroy them is called the creation redemption process. And beneath me here, you can see someone who's an authorised participant who's allowed to do this creation and redemption process. So let's say they're holding one of these receipts for an ETF. And in this case, it's the first ETF which Moss created, which is called SPY. They can hand over that receipt to State Street Global Advisors, who maintain SPY. And in return, State Street Global Advisors will hand over a basket of stocks worth the same amount as that receipt. And the opposite process would be creation, where the authorised participant hands over a basket of stocks and receives an ETF. But what this mechanism does is that it ensures the ETF trades in line with the price of its underlying assets. If there is a discrepancy between the two, the authorised participants can do the arbitrage trade to bring them back into line. So Nate Most and State Street Global Advisors were the first people to work out how this plumbing would work and the first people to launch an ETF in 1993. And the fund, which is still around and absolutely huge, is called SPY, which naturally led to the nickname Spider, and you can see a big spider behind them, which was used in the marketing push. In one of those twists of fate, there was actually a meeting between Nate Most and Jack Bogle, where Nate Moss tried to pitch the idea of ETFs to Vanguard. But Jack Bogle hated it. He said, you want people to be able to trade the S&P, but I just want them to buy it and never sell it. Bogle just hated the idea of intraday trading for ETFs. He thought there was simply no need for it. And Jack Bogle's antipathy to ETFs has cost them dearly over the years. In fact, it's taken them many years to catch up with State Street, but also with another company called BlackRock. Notice how BlackRock was ahead of the game in the early 2000s, and Vanguard was nowhere to be seen. Although more recently, it has to be said, they see similar inflows into their exchange-traded products. And the story of iShares is probably one of the most fascinating in the book. Now, we saw that the first creator of an index fund was Wells Fargo Investment Advisors. They were then bought by Barclays Global Investors. Now, the birth of iShares was largely down to someone called Patty Dunn, who you can see in this picture here. She started out as a secretary working for Wells Fargo Investment Advisors, but then she ended up as a CEO of Barclays Global Investors. Then Barclays Global Investors was bought out by a company called BlackRock under the management of Larry Fink. And that's why iShares is now one of the brands of BlackRock, such that Larry Fink is now the new king of Wall Street. 
And if you look at the largest managers of ETFs today, iShares comes up as number one. In fact, it's got one third of the global market share and it manages about $3 trillion of assets under management. Vanguard's in second place with $2 trillion and about one fifth market share and State Street Global Advisors is a distant third. But between the three of them, they control about two thirds of the ETF market. And that brings us on to our final point, which is that index funds may now be too successful. Now, Robin devotes four chapters to these concerns, and I think some of those concerns are justified. The proliferation of products is not very surprising, and I don't think much of a threat. There is an ETF for almost anything, particularly in the United States, not so much here in the UK. But there's definitely an oligopoly. In other words, large companies that control too much of the market and which are too powerful. Another worry which is justified is the supremacy of indices, but also the companies that manage those indices and also the way in which they distort markets. Now, because index funds simply track an index, the people who create the index are very powerful. And this graph is taken from a paper called Steering Capital. And what it shows is the amount of money which is managed against the indices of these three big companies. If we just look at the largest, which is S&P Dow Jones indices, you can see that about $4 trillion worth of assets are managed using their indices. And that's just for ETFs. And it's not just companies which are affected by the power of index companies, it's also countries. So for example, in 2015, there was talk of moving Peru out of the Emerging Markets Index and putting it into the much smaller Frontier Markets Index, such that the Finance Minister of Peru had to go to New York to try and stop MSCI from doing this. And if we look at single stocks, so here is the price of Tesla since the beginning of 2020, you can see that in summer 2020, there was a spike in the volume of the stock. That's when people realized it was now eligible for the S&P 500 because it had generated four successive quarters of profit, which is one of the requirements. Then when the S&P committee actually announced that it would be included in November, you can see that there was another huge jump in the stock price and a big step up in the volume of trading. Now, is that because Tesla was suddenly a better company? No, of course not. It's because the S&P is tracked by a huge amount of money. And all of those index fund providers would suddenly have to go out and buy a very large amount of Tesla stock. So I think it is a concern that we have these very large index companies which are so powerful and yet so few people realize that they wield this power. Or as Robin puts it very beautifully, indices have morphed from simple snapshots of markets into a force that exerts power over markets. So I hope you've enjoyed my take on Robin's book, Trillions. I'm not sponsored in any way by Robin, but I would strongly recommend you go out and buy it. I thought it was just a brilliantly written story. And I certainly learnt a lot about index funds and where they come from. And if you want to ask Robin your own questions, there will be a live Q&A on this channel on October the 21st at 7pm UK time. And I'm really looking forward to meeting Robin on that live Q&A. 